Our next speakers are really talking about something that's near and dear to my heart, Charles Eames. So without further ado, Karen Wilkerson. Great, thanks. Well, I'm really thrilled to be here today with Lisa Demetrius. She's a good friend and the granddaughter of Charles and Ray Eames. The Eames had a really deep tradition of making, and she really was uh, kind enough to indulge us in thinking about their work in the frame of making and maker fair. So it just it feels just right. Um, we talked about what we should include for this talk, and it actually came down to what we should eliminate for this talk, because we felt like we literally could have been having this going on for all 10 years of the fair and would still have material to cover. So it was a serious amount of editing. But what I want you to know about Lisa is she's a maker, she's a mom, uh, she is an archivist, has formal training in an archivist, and of course in this long line of tradition of makers. Um, and usually I, I just come and attend the fair, so it's really fun to be up here to share the work of Charles and Ray, my grandparents. Yeah, I've seen you here with your kids in the past, which has been great. So my part of this is really going to be to just highlight some of the ideas as they relate to making. But uh, Lisa is really just going to share her personal perspective on this and give us a glimpse of them as makers that uh, is a rare treat. So. I think most people think of Charles and Ray and their furniture. Um, they were always trying to make the best for the most for the least. But also, I think something that would resonate with all of you is they didn't believe in the gifted few. They believed you got good at what you like to do. And they like to work in many different mediums because they like to communicate their ideas in different ways, whether it was films, exhibits. I don't know if some of you know they helped set up a design school in India. Um, so it was like, as it says, art resides in the quality of, duty, of doing, process is not magic. And they did it themselves. Yeah, and as, as Lisa alluded to, and even Stuart with the film, so they're most known for their furniture, but they have this wide, incredible body of work that includes films, architecture, toys, uh, and, and textiles, and even exhibit development. So we're gonna highlight some of those things. Uh, but it's really Lisa's perspective, because she knows them so intimately and is an archivist, she's really taught me how approachable their work really was over the years. Um, but my question to you is, the scale of their work is just mind-blowing. So how did you even begin to kind of make the connections to their work? Well, I enjoyed that they really believed in an honest use of materials. So in those early versions, when you see in the upper right-hand corner, working in the molded plywood, well, to have a deep understanding of a material, they made the tools to work with that material. And actually, you will see one of those called the Kazam machine, which is when they are building out of plaster wood a way to mold the plywood. They're trying, Charles and Ray moved to Los Angeles because they wouldn't know anybody, and Charles and Ray could focus on the chair that won the competition. He and, he and Arrow had won in New York. And so what was always very special with them is they wanted to have the deep understanding of the material and honest use of the material, so whatever that was, they tried to figure it out themselves. Sometimes people ask me about that Ray was a painter and Charles was an architect. How did they work together? Well, what was special was that they would work together, but they'd also work separately in these materials, learn from the materials, and then talk about it together before they even took it into the office. So where you see in that picture, the upper right-hand corner, that's their home that they designed and built as part of the case study program. They would have those conversations privately, and they, they said they could critique each other but then also they could make changes and then see what that iteration led to. That's another thing that I think many of you would appreciate, is Charles and Ray would do iteration upon iteration to finally hone what was the best example and the best prototype. This is another thing we'll come back to, but actually Lisa doesn't even know I stuck this in at the last minute because it's just, there's, he has, they both have so many quotes that are deeply profound, but I thought this one really connected incredibly well to our setting today. Just this idea that a passion for sharing what you do. I think we're all gonna see this you know, throughout Maker Faire. And just getting ideas out there, that it's really based on ideas. Yes, so, Charles, what, Charles would get very upset about if someone said, oh, I'm just gonna jot that down on a napkin. <laughs> no, you go and make it, you go try it out, you see if it works or not, you won't know until you've tried. And another thing was, is Charles Ray, like a lot of people think of them, um, people draw before they actually make the scale model. No, Charles Ray believed, if you're working on a project and I'm saying to you, let's build a chair, what's in your head may be different than what's in my head of the molded plywood. But if you have a model in front of you, you're both talking about the same thing. So in this case, the, um, the chair on the left is the one that won the competition, uh, Charles and Arrow, in New York. 
through those ideas, being honest use of materials, and learning that when you work and produce something, the tools that you use to produce the chair are gonna change the form. That's why the chair on the right is what became evolved from the chair on the left. And it took about eight years. <laughs> so now here is an awesome picture. So, so this just shows how deeply involved they were in the process and knowing and pushing what a material can do. So tell exactly. Us about it. So the, the machine on the left, that's what Charles and Ray would call the Kazam machine. That's what they built themselves to uh, mold the plywood. And it's actually at their apartment in, New, in uh, Los Angeles. And so it's just in, in the extra bedroom. And the only problem was because it was World War II, there was a shortage of materials. Um, and that was, but they, when they could get some materials, they would do the layers of the laminated wood and then put it into the machine and mold it. And they wanted to see what forms they could make with this molding of the plywood. And it's appropriate that we follow uh, Jennifer's, Rube Goldberg's uh, work because you'll see a chain reaction of things that came next. One so thing leads to another, story. exactly. <laughs> so the piece on the left, it looks like a beautiful sculpture, and it is, but it's also informing them of how the wood's going to work in the molding of the plywood and how much tension it can give, where is it going to start to crack, where do they have to put holes in it so it can bend a different uh, direction. And the piece on the right was the armature to help hold it in one of the machines to mold it. Yeah. Now, what was interesting is in the 40s during World War II, people don't realize that sometimes one of the earliest projects was Charles and Ray were at a party, and one of their friends who was a doctor from San Diego was saying that the soldiers being carried off the field were getting more damage to their wounds because of the metal splint. And Charles and Ray were working in wood, and they wondered if the vibration of wood might be lessened, and therefore, um, and sure enough, it proved to be true. So they took the ideas of trying to make this molded plywood chair and applied it to making them into splints. And yes, they made hundreds of thousands of these in 1943, um, and that's what you see on the right. And it wasn't until I really got to know you and your mom that I really found out how much their, Im their work was impacted by wartime just in general. Can well, yes, see? because you can think of if you're making a small production in your apartment, um, you can make a few. When you're working for the government and doing it at a mass <laughs> production level, Level, you're making it by the thousands. But that's where also Charles and Ray learned another important lesson, which is an idiosyncrasy when there's only one of something can be interesting. But when you see it a thousand times in a row, it can be very annoying. Um, but to continue, so yes, the splint was so successful that on the upper right is the pilot seat, and then they're standing in a glider nose. The, the, um, military wanted to see if they could carry, because of the lightness of the wood, into um, other, other directions for the war effort. And then that's a body stretcher on the bottom right, cool. which is absolutely beautiful. So this is one of the first things when I uh, came to your house the first time that your mom pointed out for me. Uh, and I always wondered how, with so many ideas and, and such a wide range of work, how they chose what to work on. Can you talk about this? Yes, Charles would often, for a project, do a sketch like this. If you look at the first circle, might be the interest of the, op of the office, what they wanted to accomplish on the project. The second circle might be the interest of the client, but the third might be the environment, society as a whole. And what you would do is concentrate on the area that overlap for all three. So to give you an example, when working with Herman Miller on the chair, they would focus on, first of all, you would provide them with a prototype. But once something went into production, you learned how Herman Miller was going to produce it and therefore improve the prototype. So there was this back and forth, back and forth improving. But that third was also important, which was the environment. And so when Charles and Ray would learn of something like the harvesting of some of the materials might damage the environment, then to discontinue that particular material. So again, it was back and forth in considering all of these areas. Charles and Ray said you needed to care deeply of everything around you when you were designing. Yes, design is a method of action, but you have to take that all into consideration. I love that. So how about this one? Anybody recognize this as an Eames chair? <laughs> yes. I, doesn't everybody have one? No, um, no, this is an example where Charles and Ray, when they were exploring with the molded plywood, whether three, a three-point resting was you know, more stable than a four-point. It's just one of the many iterations that they did. And that's the pleasure that I have as an archivist. Yes, I worked at MoMA in New York on the Mies van der Rohe archive. They had 14,000 drawings from his American period that I helped to organize. As an archivist at that point in the early 90s, what it was, you were just trying to protect the drawings so they would last a long time. What happens today in archiving is you realize each object, like the ones that you see in front of you here, 
tell a story that's part of a bigger story. So how do you best tell that story? And that's what we tried to do for you guys today was pull some of the best ways to share these stories of Charles and Ray. And I think with, with these prototypes, I mean, I wish a, a few of them had actually been made. They're pretty awesome. Well, what's great is, so you saw that picture of what Charles and Arrow won and what it finally, so this is the in-between stages. Yeah. <laughs> and I think for working at the Exploratorium, the, the prototyping process is really near and dear to my heart. But these weren't, these weren't small scale little architectural prototypes. These were the real deal. You these were full scale. Charles and Ray liked to work with architect, I mean with chairs, they considered architecture that was the scale that you could hold in your hand. Um, over here, so when I would visit um, down at the office, I would see these jigs. And what the jigs were for was Charles and Ray were breaking down the ideas of how to fabricate the chairs into like what angle should the seat be? What worked for the most people? Should it be tilted back? So there were all these wonderful jigs that were making adjustments and everyone was testing them and seeing what worked best. And this next one, um, I, I was really excited when you found these because you said that they really didn't work in kind of 2D sketching very often. Right, as I mentioned, they really preferred just diving into the 3D version as quickly as possible. But we did do have some of the notes. Most everything is at the Library of Congress that's two-dimensional material. But what I enjoy is also working with the three-dimensional because you can see with each iteration how some things improve. Mm -hmm. Now this is La Chaise that, Charles, that actually um, Charles and Ray designed. It won a competition in the late 40s, but but it wasn't until even after Ray died that then Vitra produced it, figured out a way to do it. But you'll see in the next slide, the four iterations of how Charles and Ray were trying to figure out how they could do it. And the, so we worked with Vitra um, when they went into production. But I love just seeing all the iterations with the mesh in the upper left, with the tiles, trying to figure out how to keep it strong. The way they figured out how to do it was two separate shells that they merged together and the seam is along the edge. That's how they figured out how to do it. And this really reminds me of another one of Charles's quotes that design is a method of action. I mean, you really, you really see that here. And I, I, could, I never get tired of looking at all of these. It's, I'm so glad you found them for us. This is um, the aluminum group. Aluminum was coming out in the mid-1950s, and um, so Charles and Ray were working on a commission that Aero Saarinen had designed the home. And the point was aluminum could be a furniture, make the bases that could make it an indoor or outdoor piece of furniture. What I also love about this picture is you have heard me mention that Charles Ray liked to do something at the home before they took it into the office. That picture was taken on the back patio of the Eames house, where again, they were trying out the different ideas. Now in the next pictures you're gonna see, I'd like you to focus um, on, there was a cross brace in the, um, on the chair and the, the underside. So in the picture here are the wood versions of these. Each one is different because that's them working with Herman Miller, saying, okay, does this work? Okay, now we can fine tune it, then we do another one and then they're cast in the aluminum and then over here on the right side they look like little tiny metal pieces what it is is they will be the underside of the base of a chair or under the armrest of a stadium seating so again a lot of people say to us, well, who paid for all of this? Charles and Ray did. They wanted to make a better prototype. They wanted to make something that lasted a long time. They called it the guest host relationship. When you're hired by a client, whether you're a sculptor, a designer, an architect, your job is to anticipate as many needs of your clients before they've even thought of it. That's your expertise. So what they meant by that also is working with Herman Miller and designing a chair. You are a guest every time you sit in an Eames chair. They wanted to carry that with the level of mass production that Herman Miller offered. So when someone bought that chair and took it to their home, you were again a guest of Charles and Ray Eames. That's the scale that they were thinking of. And we were trying to, you know, I, I mentioned that we had to edit down. Literally, there are shelves and shelves and shelves. This is out There's, of Lisa's house, and there are just so many of these that really point out like how comfortable they were with iterating, which is another huge connection to me. It is. There's, there's over 1,800 versions of some of these things. <laughs> Sweating the details, <laughs> exactly. for sure. So is it safe to say, speaking of prototyping, this is kind of the theme, that they lived and breathed prototyping in where they literally lived? Yes. But this is a picture of them when they were part of the case study program. Their house was number eight. And um, yes, it only took six weeks to build, but it took three and a half years to get the parts because it was after <laughs> World War II. So yes, the, they, the home was, quote, designed for a couple, working couple whose children had gone off to college. And here it is today on the left. And there's my mother. Um, Ray had given the house to our mother. Uh, she was the only child from Charles's first marriage and 
Charles Murray did not have children, and that's me and my siblings with her, because what we ended up doing was we got unexpected visitors many times, in the thousands. And then my mother said, we need to save the house and be able to have this for multi-generations later. And so that's what she did. Great. So now we get to see some personal glimpses. Tell <laughs> so, us about these. <laughs> well, Charles Ray were not only gifted, yes, in the furniture design and all the projects, but they're also wonderful grandparents. We thought everyone's grandparents did three screen slideshows and showed you powers of 10 when they visit the office. But here's Charles <laughs> painting my brother's face. Uh, that we couldn't find a copy of Madeline, so Charles said, tell me the story, I'll draw you the pictures. <laughs> the, that studio with the boxes, that's where they made their short films, but for the visit, they converted it into a place to play and he actually took the first swing on the rope through the boxes, my grandfather. <laughs> and your mom would talk about how, how much fun it was to get a letter from yes. Charles when he was away. And they always came in Rebus for him, which yes. is so awesome. And I'll quickly translate. Lucia, I am so sorry that I cannot take you to school. Are you drinking milk like an angel? <laughs> it rained all the way to... You all can do this with me. Arkansas. <laughs> <laughs> <Isn't that incredible? laughs> we had more, but we limited some of them. So this is me. So, what, so I'm one of five grandchildren. What's extraordinary to me as a parent and um, part of a family legacy is they would fly us each down to Los Angeles. And so it wasn't going to Venice, Italy that was exciting. It's going to Venice, California that was the treat. So on the left was a visit um, when the Polaroid camera had just come out and Charles and Ray were experimenting with it. And that's me with Charles. Um, some people ask me, they say, so what's your earliest memory of Charles and Ray? Well. It's a good one, but it's also probably will be unexpected to some of you. We'd gone out to dinner and we had borscht and they asked me how I liked it. I was about four or five years old. I, I did not like it. And I said, I didn't like it very much. And Charles just turned to me and said, well, how would you have done it differently? And I thought, my goodness. And he said, um, if you're going to complain about something, you have to come up with something different and better. So what was great was we ended up having a whole conversation I think we're getting a signal. Okay, good. Oh. Um, that, that the thing is, is that if you, the point was, we talked about maybe the chef had a Russian grandmother. It was her birthday and he wanted to do something in memory of her or something. But the point was, is he taught me about constraints. And yes, that's me at the Eames house in the top picture, um, where it was the Polaroid, uh, they, was, they were filming me and photographing me on the floor of the Eames house. The next time I came down, they pulled down a screen, opened a cabinet in their living room with a projector and showed me a film above the space where I had just been the previous time drawing this letter. And I realized it was my first home theater. There was such versatility to the space they created at the Eames house. And it, this is just to share some of the wonderful letters they were always keeping in contact and sharing with and us. So I, I want to mention one thing, too, that I know you've told me before about packages that you would receive. Oh, yes. I think it's amazing that they would send you stuff. They would. It, it was For never, a specific purpose. Right. They, it was never about the price tag. It was always about what they thought the need was. So often there was something like a broken alarm clock that we could further dismantle. You know, um, it might be a new, the first disposable cameras because a sibling might be going on a trip and water was involved and they didn't think my brother would take the Nikon camera out of the case because he'd be afraid it got wet. So it was always about addressing the need. But that kind of taking apart. I mean, yes. So I asked Lisa to show us some of the things she and her mom were both, uh, both makers, really, yes. and, and kind of to talk a little bit about what you learned from them in your own work. Well, something about that I saw at the Eames office, which was really great, was they tried to do everything in-house as much as possible. So what that meant is they had a dark room, they had a stage set, they could build the prototype, they could do everything in-house. Therefore, you're not waiting for somebody. And if someone was missing that day, Charles or Ray could fill that spot. So what we tried to do, so my mom and I worked together um, making artwork um, for various settings, and here I am making the artwork. What you saw is I make the maquettes for each maquette that you saw in that picture. There were probably 80 that I threw away, just like what I learned from Charles. I do iteration upon iteration. I do lunar asparagus people. That's the one on the upper right. Um, the point is, is I, in those dowels that I have, the form is hiding in there. So my job is to cut them out on the bandsaw. I'm actually from a sculptural legacy on, both, on the other side of my family as well. So working in bronze came very naturally. 
And your mom, I mean, the amazing thing this to is me her is work, that she mother's. was working into her 80s yes. and a rather hip maker herself, uh, learning kind of things like water jet. Yes. You know, so that fluency with new tools. And actually, you, you said something about she, your, your relationship with tools came well, from her. My, I, I had a mother who gave me power tools for my birthday and taught me how to weld. So that's pretty cool just right there. <laughs> um, but what was also is she kept learning and she kept watching how um, technology advanced and made things easier. So with like the laser cutting on the bottom right picture for the Sunburst series, she, when she first started designing, you could only pierce the metal once and it had to be a continuous design. Well, of course, with computers and laser cutting, it improved to the point where it could pierce 10,000 times if you wanted. So she liked how the technology could assist her to make more interesting designs and take these things further. The other thing is my mom liked to recycle things in different ways. So the drops from the piece on the bottom got turned into the piece on the top, and that turned into summer solstice, 24, hour, 24 suns, 24-hour 24 day. Yeah, I love that. Here's Charles and Ray. Um, again, back to that guest host relationship. They would do scale models like for the exhibits. That's actually more what I saw was the exhibit designs for Franklin and Jefferson, which was in the 70s. Um, also, they did Mathematica, World of Numbers. There's a set in Boston. There's one in New York. And the third set, we're very happy to say, is going to the Henry Ford Museum in Michigan. And, um, and so what they, the reason the scale model was helpful, it could show the PR team what was about to arrive. It could show the people who would install it what to expect and where things should be. It allowed the director to talk about it. So the scale model helped that guest host relationship too. So this, in this picture, I mean, so, so Charles isn't really doing something that you would think is totally unexpected for an architect, right. but Ray's background as a painter, um, I, he you, I heard, I think it was your mom who told this story about Ray was being interviewed about, uh, you know, yes. was she saw, sad or sorry to have given up painting. Can you it, tell us what her yes, answer was? It, it was after Charles had passed away and there was an interview with Ray in the 1980s and um, so, some interviewer was appearing very apologetic, like, it must have been so difficult to give up painting Mrs. Eames. And my grandmother just turned to him and said, I didn't give up painting, I just changed the palette. <laughs> <laughs> and so the point was what she was talking about is she was changing the materials. I mean, something, but with the material, whether it was wood or it was metal, and it was just, I mean, I had a grandmother that would hang paintings from the ceiling straight down because she wanted to see how that perspective looked. So it, she never gave up painting. So you like that you would look at them yeah, like that. Yeah, you would yeah. look at that way. I mean, I think they worked so well together, and you talked right. about even the critique process was very important to yes, both of them. Yes, they, so in the 40 years there of the Eames office when the two of them were, were were uh, together at the, in Los Angeles. What was amazing is only two people in that office, and many people, I think we counted up, over 400 people came and went over those 40 years, but only two people had equal say, and that was Charles and Ray. And there was such a mutual respect because they knew each one was coming at the situation and it was a way to problem solve and how to make it best. Yeah. So here's another, I love this example. This, uh, I saw this the first time I visited Lisa's house too. So, they really involved everyone in the process, grandkids, kids, and anybody who happened right. to come in the office. So tell us what these are. <laughs> so when you have a scale model, and you have to understand there's a time before Adobe Photoshop, you have to have scale people. Well, how are you gonna have scale people? You make them. So people <laughs> who worked at the office, and even people who visited the Eames office, that's Mr. and Mrs. DJ Dupree, who owned Hernerman Miller in the third box from the left, standing there, <laughs> would be asked to stand on the stage that Charles Ray had at the office and to look up, to look down. It was called You Were Dressing for the City at that time. So we have drawers and drawers, and that's Charles um, in the upper picture for an exhibit, for, I think it was photography in the city, and then the bottom one, is um, for Franklin and Jefferson. And for Franklin and Jefferson, it was such a large show, they actually not only did a scale model, they rented a space near the office and did a full scale mock-up just to make sure everything would work well. Again, that guest host relationship. Yeah. And I mean, you, you said that they didn't really sketch much, but photography was a big part, you know, just from even taking the pictures of people to put into architectural models, but it played a huge role. Well, yes, I think when you're doing a seven screen slideshow in Moscow, you need a lot of slides and, and when you do films. So one of the things, the first projects are, um, our mother had us do was we shipped 750,000 slides to the Library of Congress. It's 5% of their slide collection. And we also, because Wait Charles- Wait a second, 5%? 
Five percent of their slide collection Amazing. is Charles and Ray. Amazing. And we have one minute. <laughs> oh. um, and then just the last, yes, Charles, the, we considered film, um, it's always their essays. That was the first project our mother did. Do you remember laser discs and things like that? Well, that was our first transfer. And now what we do is we offer p uh, many of their films on the web. So I hope you will visit the Ames office website. This is the movie Tops. Well, you know, well, you know the quote for this. No, I do, I do. I love these, but the toys are uh, not as innocent as they look, but they're precursors <laughs> to some really uh, serious ideas. Which is and Tops, the film was often used um, sometimes at MIT, because it's the same way tops move the same way the Milky Way and so the solar system does. So they're, they're oops. Let's go for it. Okay, we'll, we'll just go. We're going to go with, this is, uh, so Char can we do one second? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Charles and Ray did Solar Do Nothing Machine. It was a way to introduce, by making a machine that does nothing, is there volume on this? Or do we have There's to stop oh, talking? Oh, yeah, we, we should have sound on this. Here, I'll back I'll be it up. quiet. We, we won't show you powers of 10, but what we did want to show you is this one, the solar do nothing machine. It's absolutely one of my personal favorites. And it's a way that they could show about solar energy and maybe conservation of natural resources was also behind this. Oh, but no sound. It's got really, really nice sound. But I would, en I would encourage you um, to check out all of their films. Well, online. they can watch the it on the list. Yeah, oh, there please. we go, at the Eames office. And they did this at the Eames house. This is in the meadow at the Eames house, another project. So whimsical, so, so playful. Off. This one's about to turn off too, <laughs> because a cloud comes by. Because a cloud comes by. <laughs> <laughs> so, thank you very much. <laughs> we'll be around afterwards. Lisa is going to kind of go over there if you want to ask some questions and just meet her and say hello personally. Yes, thank you. So, for people who want to ask questions, please come up to the central mic. Here. Oh. oh, okay. We didn't know if we were done. Do we have you time? Have time for questions? Oh, okay, good. Oh, great. <laughs> We d hey, <laughs> high five. <laughs> we we had people taking bets that we would not get through this, <laughs> that we wouldn't make it all the way through the photos. Any questions? I have a question. Yes. Uh, is the chair the holy grail of design? Is the chair the LCW? It's, it, the, I mean, it seems that so many designers create chairs. Uh, I just think it's back to that idea of it's architecture you can hold in your hand and therefore you can control all the parts. When you build a house, you need a painter, a plumber, and all of those pieces. Charles also would talk about, of, in the Depression time, when he worked on projects, he liked that he got to work on so many different parts. He got to design the pews, the lighting, he helped set the bricks. So again, that hands-on, not, he believed, I would never delegate understanding, and that's part of that. So with the chair, they could make all those choices in-house. He also had a great response when people were asked him about being a genius. Like, what oh. did he say? <laughs> Charles said, we're not a genius, we just work longer. <laughs> also yeah. with the maker ethos, you know? <laughs> exactly. Yes. So 
You, you talk so much about those two people and all the things that they've created and a tre tremendous body of work. But I know that it's not like that. To actually make something and to make things that go into production, you need tons of people to do these things. Otherwise, you literally, you are up all night. Can right. you please talk about their firm, how many people they had? Did they have people in charge of you know, wood and fabric and Well, let me put it this way. Watching Charles and Ray, they did so much themselves. It was like watching a master chessman play 30 different matches. So I would see my grandfather go to one table and my grandmother go to another table. The, the the space was very flexible, so the center area could be used on whatever project. And yes, there was a team that they worked with. And if you want to see, if you look in the Eames design book, what well, at the very top is for each project who worked on that project. Sometimes there's a few people that Charles and Ray worked with, and sometimes a large group. But the two people that were on every project were Charles and Ray. I mean, did they have a staff? Did they have people oh, yeah. of uh, you know 30, 40? I don't know. How, can you talk a little sometimes bit about Sometimes it was life? usually in the early years. It was only about eight. And at most, it was probably about 25 oh, wow. for the Franklin and Jefferson. It wasn't that big. Yeah. It wasn't that big. But they also, the people would work in one area. Like, for example, you, we interviewed many people who worked at the office just to get some of the stories, the oral histories. And one person gave an example of, they were, Charles and I were working on a chair, and um, they, they, Charles told them at the end of the day, which is, of course, 11 o'clock at night, because they work so late at night every night, as my mother would say, it was going back to the mines after dinner. The thing was is that um, he said, put the chair in a new position. So the, the staff member put it on the ceiling and hung it upside down. The point was, was when Charles and I walked in the next day, they saw it with fresh eyes, and they did. So again, they would often be working on several projects at once. Does that answer some of it? Yeah, no, thank and you And so I would also just encourage you. So we we blew by, by the photo for Powers of 10, but this is actually them outside of 901. Mm -hmm. If you Google 901, there's actually a nice film that was made about the studio that'll give you more of a sense right. of, of My brother, team. so there, there's a joke in our family that um, Charles had a sister named Adele and she got, she got married and moved to the South. There was a big storm and no one heard from her for a few days. So finally she got through to Charles and Charles, she says, you wouldn't believe it. There were people, like animals flying through the air. There's flooding in the streets. There are cats in the trees, all of these things. Charles said, I'm so glad you're all right. Did you get photos? So <laughs> when we closed the office, we had to document it. So you do get to see pictures of what the office looked like and how they moved it in different ways if you visit the website. Yeah, it was a really cool space. And I don't, okay. I don't know I think how much time we have left, but will you just say something about, because Powers of Ten was a profoundly huge film, like about it? For um, Powers of Ten to us as a family is very special. It was one of their last projects and that was completed after Charles passed away. And uh, Phil Morrison um, from MIT did the narration of the Powers of Ten. That's Charles on a crane zooming down. Um, that's at the back, as you said, the back lot of 901. Picnics were um, every day at the Eames office and up at the Eames house. So the fact that they picked a picnic to center on, the early version had it coming out of Florida. But what they realized is that the Milky Way wouldn't line up as a perfect spiral. So that's why they switched it to Chicago. So it would come out correctly <laughs> from that direction. So again, a very hands-on and deeply involved. Even what's picked on the picnic was very Charles and Ray, what's on that. So um, it's, it's very special in many, many ways, like so much of their work. Where was the beach? Where was the, in Florida? The beach. The beach. In Oh, I can't remember, but I just remember in that version, they had a clock, which they decided to remove, and they, it goes past a jet airplane. I can't remember the and, name of it. And why did they decide to remove the clock? The which one? The clock. Why did they take the clock Oh, out? the clock was, they only wanted to have in Powers of Ten what they could absolutely perfectly prove, which is at the time it even ends. And the clock, they weren't quite sure how time would change in the 70s, pulling out so far. So that's why they took out the clock. The mm -hmm. other part was, um, that they didn't know that quarks were not quite proven. So yes, there's been five more powers of 10 since they've moved, three at the smaller, two at the larger, that we've added on the website. And even this, not an idea like that just came to be. They had 15 years prior to that, they had done the powers of two for a peep show for IBM. So exactly. one idea leads to the next. It's a chain reaction, as I think yeah. many of you understand. <laughs> one thing yeah. leads to another. Great. So thank you very well, much. Thank you very much.